15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This video is um, for Jessica Allison, and this is the story of the treatment for my OB and switching OBs during my current pregnancy with HG. So I am 29 weeks pregnant and I'm in my third trimester. I've recently been switched over to a different OB. My previous OB, um, there were definitely some problems there with her because she didn't quite grasp or maybe was in denial or didn't believe in hyperemesis. I really don't know what her deal was. Um, so I went back to her after she delivered my daughter. I, during my second pregnancy, I was working with midwives throughout my pregnancy, but my pregnancy had been complicated and I had had HG and other things going on. And at the very end of that pregnancy, um, I was switched over to her care and I had my daughter by cesarean a week later with this OB. And when we met her, she made a really good first impression. And I thought, you know, if I do have another kid and I need an OB, then I'll definitely know where to go. And so when we decided that we wanted to get pregnant again and um, with our third child, I went back to her, had a preconception consult with her. I had voiced that I had concerns about HG and some of the other things that I was dealing with. And um, it, it kind of blew over. She didn't seem overly concerned about it. And I didn't look into that too much or anything and went home and a couple months later went back, saw her because I was pregnant. Um, and I was sick and um, the hyperemesis was really kicking my butt. And so, um, during the whole time that I had been seeing her for six months of this pregnancy, it was a battle. It was just a, this tension constantly about me being sick and my plan of care. You know, at first it was, she was kind of hesitant about prescribing Zofran because I was so early on. I was like seven weeks long and, or maybe eight weeks, somewhere right in there. And so we were trying some other things like fenugrin, and it was really knocking me out, making me comatose, which doesn't work with a three-year-old running around the house. And so then eventually she gave me Zofran, and I started taking that. Um, but we weren't doing; she wasn't doing much of anything else. I hadn't even seen her yet, <clears throat> even though she was prescribing the medication. I hadn't even had my like first official appointment with her since being pregnant. And I was going into the ER for fluids um, and just constantly sick. And so when I did go see her, I don't remember how far along I was. Maybe it was around 10 weeks or so. And, you know, she kind of was like, okay, you know, you're sick. You're on Zofran. Like, we can get you some other medications if you want to try some other medications. But fluids was never there, like, as a suggestion from her. Um, she never emphasized any importance, and she was taking some lab work from me, and she said, your labs look good. You know, she didn't really seem concerned with how sick I was. And it continued to get worse, and then I saw her colleague one day. I was scheduled to see her, but she was really busy. And her colleague came in, she took a look at me, and she said, oh, we are putting you on a pick lane. And... She could see how ill I was and how depleted and dehydrated I was. And so when my OB found out that I had a pick line in ordered by her colleague, she was not happy with that. Um, and she made that pretty known. And then she, I had that in for about seven weeks. And when I went in to go see her for another regular routine appointment. She's like, we're pulling the pick line out. You don't need it anymore. And I said, but I'm still sick. What do you mean I don't need it anymore? And she just said, I needed to try harder 
that it didn't matter how much I was stirring up, that I just needed to set timers and eat and drink normally and, you know, pretty much just push through and stop bypassing my gut, that I was getting lazy, that my gut was going to get lazy. Um, and that was really like kind of a blow to hear from her. It's not the kind of treatment that I expected from her and from the impression that she had made on me when I first met her. Um, and so she, you know, I pleaded with her to let me keep the pick line. She was absolutely against it. She said she did not want the liability of me having the pick line in, which I understand the risk of a pick line. I totally do. And I'm in a, a couple of hyperemesis support groups. I'm in a support group for women that have um, pick lines, IVs, and um, tube, feeding tubes and things like that during pregnancy. So I'm well aware of the risks that come with it, but she was adamant that she did not want the liability on her shoulders for me having a pick line in. And that was pretty much her primary reason for pulling it out. So anyway, she pulls the pick line out and then within like 10 days of having it out, I was so sick again, like way worse than I was with the pick line in. And I was losing weight, like a pound a day. Um, and was going into the ER for fluids and that went on for a few weeks and then she decided to, to say okay you know let's get you into urgent care a couple times a week for fluids and I you know I was excited that she was getting on board I felt like maybe she was hearing me out a little bit but before that had happened before she had agreed to you know say okay let's send you to urgent care a couple times a week for some fluid I was at the point where I was already feeling so unheard and that she did not believe that I was ill things would happen where I would call and try to get a hold of her and her nurse would have to tell me your labs look fine so you're fine the doctor says you're fine and I would just get so frustrated and say I'm not fine I'm so sick how can I be throwing up all this time no fluids no food I'm not okay like I don't care what my labs say I'm not okay and as long as my labs always look good then in her mind I was fine and it started feeling like she just really didn't believe that I was sick that maybe she thought I was just if this was in my head or that I'm crazy I don't know what she was thinking um, except for that it she made it very clear to come across as that she wasn't going to do a whole lot for treating me um, so anyways I started going I had right before that appointment I think it was like around my 18 week mark 17 weeks somewhere in there because I was going in for an anatomy scan and I had made a list of my research on hyperemesis, reasons why hydration was important for women with hi uh, hyperemesis. I had just listed everything out because I thought I have to find a way to appeal to this doctor's senses and maybe she just needs like more research or something. Maybe she doesn't know a lot about this illness. And I was trying to give her a benefit of the doubt and keep a level of respect for her. Um, I was really hoping to not have to find another doctor or switch doctors at that point, but I was so stressed out. I had so much anxiety going in to see her. And then she came in and she says, okay, you know, before I even got started talking, she says, we're going to send you down to urgent care for fluids twice a week. Um, at first she was just going to do one time a week with one liter. And I talked to her and I said, I really feel like I do better with two liters you know, at least a couple times a week, so we compromised there. And I was starting to go to urgent care a couple times a week for two liters of fluid. But it was a struggle to get IVs in, and um, I, my veins were collapsing, they were blowing, it was painful, it was covered in bruises, my arms were swelling. Um, it just was not going well because I was just so dehydrated and not getting enough nutrients or anything in. And the nurses there, you know, after a few weeks of that were like, we don't want to do this to you anymore. This seems like abuse. Why can't your doctor do 
something else? Like, is there any, have you talked to her? You know, they were very concerned, very compassionate. They were doing everything they could to try to take care of me while I was there at the urgent care. But, you know, across the board, every time I went to urgent care or ER, I had doctors and nurses saying, what is going on with your OB? Why is she not treating you? Why is she not changing your plan of treatment? This is not working for you. You need to do something else. Um, you know, this is your life and your baby's life. And so it started compounding, you know, and I started thinking, she's really wrong here. It's not me. It's her. And I've got so many people, these professional medical professionals, doctors and nurses saying, what is going on? Um, you're so ill and you're so dehydrated and um, you need to have another plan. And so then it got to the point that the urgent care just said, we can't do this. And so they called down the head nurse from the OB practice and she took a look at my arms and she said, I'm so sorry. And we all know how your doctor feels about this and you're not going to be able to get another pick line. You could tell through the way she was talking to me that she just kind of felt like her hands were tied. And she said, I'm going to just have you start going up to the L&D triage upstairs in the hospital. So I started doing that and L&D triage, same thing. The nurses were super kind and, um, you know, always wanted to try to do their best for me. But they struggled, too, to get IVs in, and it was, you know, for weeks on end, like, probably close to two months, I was just getting jabbed repeatedly because um, it'd be so hard to get an IV started, and then once it would start, it wouldn't keep going, and I was trying different routes, too. I mean, I had tried the urgent care, but then there was another OB in town who was willing to just say, she said, you know, I'll just be part of your team. You need hydration, you need nutrients. So just come into the office for fluids and we can take care of you here and you can still see your other OB. And she was an option that I was taking up because I wasn't interested in switching OBs at that point in the pregnancy. And um, this other OB was willing to just be part of a team for me and hydrate me and get me what I needed that my doctor wasn't getting for me. <clears throat> and her nurses were struggling to get fluids going in me. Um, so urgent care, another OB, ER, um, and l and triage. It was a constant struggle to get fluids in me because I was just so dehydrated and bleated all the time. And then there was, we were running out of places to put IVs because my arms were just so bruised and, and swollen. And so um, my veins would just roll away or collapse or blow. And um, the last time, right before the last time that I was in L&D triage for fluids, the OB on call happened to be the OB that had ordered my pick line originally, the calling of my doctor, and that they're in the same practice together. And she looked at me again and she was like, this is not okay. You cannot keep going this way. She talked to my husband and I for a while. Super compassionate, very knowledgeable about hyperemesis. I mean, she's like, we were talking and I said, well, my doctor just keeps saying I'm fine because my labs are fine, even though I'm not. And she said, she said, that doesn't matter if your labs are fine. She's like, I don't want to see your labs get bad because if they get bad, I'm not doing my job right. You know, and you're going to be in the hospital. Like, we need to prevent that. Um, it's not just about your labs being fine. And when she said that, I just felt so heard and I said well the other thing is is that I haven't lost any weight but I'm also not gaining any weight and I think I was around 22 weeks at that point and I had put on like four pounds during the pregnancy um, and pretty much that was just weight that I gained every time I went in for fluid and then it would come off and then come back on every time I went in for fluid and she called that out for what it was too. She says, it's just from the times that you're getting fluid because you come in here, you lose, and then you come back and you gain and then you lose. And it's just the fluids that you're getting. And I mean, I just felt like she understood hyperemesis so well that she understood me, that she was listening to me. She had concern and compassion for what I was going through. And um, I went home that night with my husband and I thought I should just switch doctors. It's time, like this is, I need help and she this doctor is obviously going to be willing to help me whereas my current doctor was not 
Well, the weekend went by, and on that Monday, no, it wasn't that Monday. It was actually, yeah, it was that, that Monday. Um, I think it was that Monday, somewhere right in there. I got a phone call, and the head nurse of the office said, okay, we're going to send you over to maternal fetal medicine to get you looked at if you need a pick line. And I was super surprised because I thought, I said, oh, I said, my doctor is back on board with that. And she said, no, um, but she's willing to have you have a pick line in if maternal fetal medicine agrees to take the liability and they're the ones responsible for the pick line and not her. And I said, okay, um, you know, however it works, as long as I'm getting treatment, right? So that Friday of that week, I went into maternal fetal medicine. And I had this kind of gut feeling that it wasn't going to go well. And I remember telling my husband, I'm afraid that my doctor would sabotage this appointment, which to me felt like a crazy thought, just like anxiety. But turns out that's exactly what happened. I went into my maternal fetal medicine appointment and the doctor comes in and the first thing he says is he's like, good news you don't have hyperemesis. And I looked at him and I said, what? Then what do I have? He says, well, you have nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. And I said, that is exactly what HG is. It's severe debilitating nausea and vomiting. I said, it doesn't ever stop. How do I not have HG? And he goes, well, I agree with your doctor. You don't have HG and you don't need a pick line. And my heart sunk so heavy into my stomach and I thought okay I knew exactly what had happened she obviously had talked with him prior to this appointment and had sabotaged any help that I could have gotten from maternal fetal medicine that she was putting a stop to them helping me as well and after talking with him and explaining to him everything that I had been through what my symptoms were like he said well you don't have my paramesis but maybe we can get you a midline because he saw the condition of my arms, which were in terrible shape. Like the hospital was telling me that they were going to have to go through my feet or my neck for IVs now because there was nowhere left to put an IV in me, in my arms or wrists or hands. And I mean, they were, I had IVs going all the way from here, all the way up my arm, on both arms. And so anyways, um, I get out to the parking lot and I just start sobbing and I call my husband and I tell him what happened and he was so upset with what had gone on. He goes, I just don't, he says, I don't get it. I don't understand why she feels like you're just making this up. Like nobody can make up how sick you are. And I went into the hospital that night because it was a Friday night and that's when I would go in for my fluids because I always went in twice a week. And the doctor on call there, this OB that I hadn't met before, she comes in the room and she says, do you really feel like you need to be here? Are you sick? Do you really feel like you're sick? And I just knew what was going on. And before I could answer her, she says, I looked at your file and it looks like your doctor and maternal fetal medicine agree that you are not sick, that you do not have hyperemesis and that you don't need a pick line. And I looked at her and I was so angry. And I said, I'm not here for a pick line. I'm just here to get some fluids tonight and I need them. And I said, I understand the risks and complications that come with a pick line. It's not why I'm here. I'm just here to get some fluid. And she goes, well, do you really feel like you need them? And I said, of course I do. I'm sick. I'm throwing up. Like, I don't keep anything down. I need fluid. And so she said, okay, I will get you a liter tonight. And I said, no, I need two liters. I do better with two liters. I'm not getting enough fluid. The least I can get is two. And she said, okay. And I was sobbing. I was just so upset. And so now I'm sitting here thinking, okay, my doctor, not only has she not heard me out throughout six months of this pregnancy of just being in hell with hyperemesis and tooth and nail fighting her to get any kind of treatment and then her sabotaging my maternal fetal medicine appointment, putting in my file that I'm not sick and making me seem like I must just be crazy when I have other OBs coming in that don't know me and they're saying, you're not sick. I was so upset. So that weekend, 
I was telling my husband, I said, I really feel like I just, it's time to switch. Like, this is so unacceptable, but I want to talk to my OB one last time. And I just want to talk to her, try to remedy this. I don't want there to be any, you know, bad energy between the two of us, but I think I just need to switch. And I would like to understand why in the world she has put me through even more hell than I needed to go through. Um, and fighting her for treatment. Like, I just I wanted to understand why she was being that way and why she wouldn't seem to hear me out or believe how ill I've been. Well, <clears throat> I didn't get that opportunity. Um, I called it m that Monday morning, and I wanted to set up an appointment with her and a consultation with her colleague because I was thinking about just transferring over to her colleague, but I, you know, I had my reservations because I don't want to make a switch to an OB and then find out it's not a good fit. So, um, and that OB had told me at the hospital, the L&D triage, that I could call her anytime if I needed anything, um, or if I had any questions. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll just call, I'll set up a consultation to meet with her so I can make sure her and I are really a good fit and what she's, what she would do for me in, as far as treating the hyper -emesis. And I can talk with my doctor and figure out what the heck is going on here. You know, if I really need to make the switch, if she's just in denial about hyper because I just didn't understand why in the world a doctor would be treating me that way when I had so many other medical professionals on my side understanding what I was going through and totally baffled by her lack of care. Well, I was told by the front desk as soon as I called, they said, you're not allowed to do this. You cannot talk to another doctor. You cannot switch providers. You cannot do this. Have you tried talking to your doctor? And I said, of course I have. And at that point, I already knew that it was illegal and unethical for them to tell me that I was not allowed to talk to another doctor or switch providers if I wanted to. Um, but they scolded me and I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is ridiculous. I felt so trapped uh, because now I was thinking, how am I going to be able to talk to this other doctor who was willing to help me? I can't get in to see my doctor and find out what's going on with her. And I'm getting scolded by the front desk and told I can't talk to them. Um, so a few hours later that afternoon, I get a phone call from the nurse and she says, you're no longer with your doctor. We've switched you over to the other provider. Um, we're getting everything taken care of. So let's get you an appointment made so you can come in and talk with her about your treatment for hyperemesis. <coughs> so apparently my doctor had dropped me as a patient, which I don't even think doctors can do, as far as I know, that's not even legal to drop a pregnant patient, let alone a high-risk pregnant patient, but she did, and I got switched over. So anyways, it was kind of a relief, really, but um, just totally disappointed and feeling like I couldn't get any closure with her and I wasn't going to understand where she was coming from. And so I went in for my first appointment with this new OB. Her and I talked and hit it off really well. She decided that she was going to put the pick line in. I went in, got the pick line put in, and when I went in to have the pick line put in, it was the same team that had put in my first one. They saw the condition of my arms. They were just totally mind blown about the treatment of my previous OB and why she would pull out a perfectly good pick line. And, you know, I could just, the way they were talking to me and the looks on their faces, I, you know, it, it's the same as all the other ER doctors, LND, triage, the other OB that was in town that was trying to hydrate me. It's the same reaction. Why? Why did your doctor put you through this? Um, so anyways, we got the pick line put in. A week later, my new OB wanted to see me again for a follow-up to see how I was doing and how the pick line was doing. And she walks in the room and she's like, you've got big brother watching you. And I said, what do you mean? And she says, well, somebody reported me today um, to maternal fetal medicine for putting a pick line in your arm. And I said, well, we know who did that. How does she know what's going on with my treatment? Well, I guess she had found out through my files or however, I don't know, that I had an appointment that day. She called the doctor at maternal fetal medicine. They tried to gang up on my doctor and force her to take the pick line out of my arm at that appointment 
my doctor was basically like, hell no, I'm not doing that. She's keeping it in. She's only had it like a week. She's my patient now. This is my call. And she was fighting it out with them. And I was there for a couple of hours while that was going on. And while I was there, my previous OB was there. And I said, I really want to talk to her. This needs to stop. Like, she's trying to sabotage my my treatment and undermine my new doctor. She's, this is somehow like a violation to me. It's a violation of privacy. It's a violation of my treatment. She wasn't my doctor anymore. Like, she had no right to be getting involved with my care or trying to stop the care that I was getting. Um, and, of course, she wouldn't come in and talk to me. And she refused um, but my doctor, my new OB, she fought for it, and she said, you're going home, you're keeping the pick line, like, I don't care what happens, we're going to keep that in, it's helping you, um, and she said, I'm going to fight this, so, and she did, um, and she called me personally a few days later, and she's like, it's sorted out, it's taken care of, you get to keep your pick line. So, anyways, that is my experience dealing with a bully OB that did not believe that I was ill, um, I went through a lot of months of being sick with, you know, bare minimum of what I, treatment of what I could have had that could have helped me get through it better during those harder months. Because although I'm still sick and I have the pick line in, it's not near as bad as it was during the first um, trimester and halfway three quarters through second trimester. It's only started to improve over the last couple of weeks since I've had the second pick line in. Imagine that because I am getting fluid every day again. So um, it makes a world of difference when you have an OB that is knowledgeable about this illness, that is caring and compassionate about what you are going through because it's absolutely devastating to have hyperemesis and when you have an OB that doesn't care or doesn't listen or puts you down or tells you that you need to try harder or that you're lazy or whatever other thing they an OB will say which in the support groups I have just seen horrible things that doctors have said to come in with this illness it just makes so much of a difference when an OB is willing to be knowledgeable about what's going on with a pregnant woman who is this ill and then be compassionate enough to do something about it and help them get through it.